Prominence came to nurse midwife Maud Callan when a national magazine told the story of how she served her community despite limited funds and primitive facilities. Donations poured in from readers to help realize her ambition, the construction of this clinic, a proud landmark for the people of Berkeley County, South Carolina, to whom Maud Callan has been doctor, dietitian, psychologist, and friend for over 30 years. With full professional training, Maud Callan is one of only 300 registered nurse midwives in the nation. And in one of the areas most affected by the countrywide shortage of doctors, she's eased a tremendous burden for the county's understaffed health department. Built with contributions totaling some $25,000, the clinic has been outfitted with the most up-to-date equipment possible, affording Maud Callan the opportunity to accomplish still more for the sake of the people and the community to whom her life has been devoted. The first Negro to hold the rank of general in the U.S. Army was Benjamin O. Davis. Now retired, he served during World War II as special coordinator to the European Theater Commander, later as assistant to the Inspector General, the department of the Army charged with protecting the rights of the enlisted man. The retirement of Brigadier General Benjamin Davis was marked by special ceremonies at the White House in which President Truman presented a scroll commemorating his half century in uniform. 50 years of service in which General Davis proved an able and outstanding representative of the race. One of the country's foremost educators is Dr. F.D. Patterson, president of the multi-million dollar Phelps Stokes Fund which has done much to aid the causes of Negro education and race relations. It was Dr. Patterson, then president of Tuskegee, who conceived the United Negro College Fund, a revolutionary innovation in educational financing, which helped establish him as a leader in the field. Dr. Patterson's international stature led to his choice as one of the three U.S. representatives on a World Bank mission to visit Nigeria for a 90-day survey of the area. The third man off the plane, Dr. Patterson and his colleagues undertook the most comprehensive survey of its kind in Africa, assessing Nigeria's resources and potentialities, charting a plan for United Nations aid through the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, a pilot study pointing the way for progress in West Africa, the hopeful beginning of a new kind of history. Few have been in the public eye so long and so consistently as Joe Lewis, both as one of the great ring champions of all time and as a representative of his race before the nation. During his service in World War II, Joe's tireless patriotic efforts could only reinforce the admiration and respect his great sportsmanship had earned. He was publicly acclaimed by the nation's highest figures. Following his retirement, Joe Lewis appeared in a new guise with a variety act, later in a table tennis exhibition series. Something new for the Brown Bomber, whose sports greatness remains undimmed. A rising star in the musical world is pianist Philippa Schuyler, who recently toured Scandinavia and Europe with enormous success. A concert pianist and composer since the age of four, Philippa's childhood works were performed by some of the nation's leading orchestras before she reached her teens. Today, Philippa Schuyler's early promise is being realized to the acclaim of the public and critics alike. One of our time's great legal advocates is Thurgood Marshall, whose courtroom arguments have been hailed by the profession for their force and lucidity. Honors are frequent in the life of Thurgood Marshall, whose career has been in the vanguard of those working for the progress of the race. W.C. Handy was in the news again when he remarried at the age of 80, when the famed composer and his bride, for 16 years his secretary, made their first appearance in society as man and wife, hundreds were on hand to offer congratulations. The cutting of the cake was a touching high point of W.C. Handy's party. At New York's Metropolitan Baptist Church, 
Henry Armstrong, one of boxing's all-time greats, was welcomed by Barney Ross, another ring immortal, as the only man ever to simultaneously hold three ring championships, revisited the city where he won sports fame. Now he's an ordained minister battling the evils of the world. A top-level member of the city administration of New Haven is George Crawford, nationally recognized authority on municipal law, who was recently named the city's corporation council. In the course of his half-century legal career, Mr. Crawford has served on many important civic commissions and the boards of both Tuskegee Institute and Talladega College. The Easter 1947 wedding of Nat King Cole drew nationwide publicity, for Nat Cole was and is one of the nation's most popular singers and musicians, a full-fledged star whose every action is followed in the public press. His many recording, movie, and television activities, as well as a rugged schedule of personal appearances, leaves King Cole all too little vacation time. In Miami, for a restful week before the beginning of his most recent European tour, he took his much-needed vacation seriously. He wouldn't even pose at a piano. King Cole is always ready to aid a good cause. His combination birthday and bon voyage party was a benefit for the Harlem YMCA held at the Savoy Ballroom. The biggest crowd in the night spot's history, over 5,000, paid a memorable tribute to one of America's great entertainers. Juan O. Hernandez, well known for his work in films and on the stage, spends as much time as possible at his Puerto Rican resort when not occupied with acting assignments. A scholarly master of stagecraft, Juan O. Hernandez received double honors from the island's university in San Juan, a doctor of fine arts degree, plus a professor's appointment, a new role for a famous actor. Matthew Henson is one of the great names in American exploration for the vital part he played in Commodore Peary's historic North Pole Expedition of 1909. Many honors have come to him. The first Negro to stand at the top of the world and the last survivor of the expedition. Retired after 43 years in the New York Customs Office, he's still vigorous and still active, ready to assist such civic groups as Philadelphia's Armstrong Association which recently sponsored Matthew Henson Day in the Quaker City. Mr. and Mrs. Henson were greeted at the City Hall by Mayor Clark, who issued an official proclamation to commemorate the occasion. Through the years, Matthew Henson, by the example of achievement and character, has served as an outstanding representative of the race. After the ceremonies, the group visited Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell, where Matthew Henson, a great explorer and a great American, paid homage at the Shrine of Freedom. International fame came to Dr. Ralph Bunch in 1949 when he returned from the Near East to report success in negotiations for an armistice between battling Israeli and Arab forces, an achievement which earned him the first Nobel Prize ever awarded a Negro. Countless other distinctions were conferred on him as well including some 20 honorary degrees from the nation's leading universities, among them Howard University, where Dr. Bunch headed the Department of Political Science for years. He later played an important role with the State Department during the formation of the United Nations. America's most eminent public figures joined in acclaiming Ralph Bunch. A testimonial banquet at New York's Waldorf Astoria was attended by thousands honoring the man who had ended the brief but bloody war in Palestine. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt led the applause for Dr. Ralph Bunch, one of the greatest Negroes of all time, a high-ranking member of the United Nations staff, global statesman and spokesman for some of mankind's highest ideals. The United Nations needs and merits the active support of every one of us. It is, after all, our, the people's business. 
For how can civilization and mankind survive and progress unless we have peace? Unless people, all people, are free. Unless there is hope for progressively improving living standards for all people. Unless there is morality and justice, international as well as national. Unless racial and religious bigotries are completely eliminated and we can cultivate a true spirit of brotherhood among all men. A young man in the news is Clifford Alexander, a junior at Harvard and the first of the race ever elected president of the university's student council, an important campus position that carries with it the administration of the organization's $40,000 annual budget. The council, whose reports often influence university policy, is one of Harvard's most important undergraduate bodies, and as its head, he's in a position of responsibility to the entire academic community. A candidate for scholastic honors upon his graduation, Clifford Alexander is already looking ahead to a career in law or politics, and every indication is that he'll be a newsmaker of tomorrow.